working for Tesco, Sainsbury's, and I ran Talk Talk, the phone and broadband business, for about eight years. And three or four years ago, I started to think about what I wanted to do next, because I'm a really, really big believer in the two-term presidency rule. The American founding fathers got it right. You shouldn't really be the leader of a large organisation for much longer than eight to ten years because you start to go stale. At least that's, that doesn't mean that there aren't exceptions that prove the rule, but on average. So I started to think about what was I going to do when my eight years came up. And I concluded that I actually cared. The stuff I did outside of Talk Talk, campaigning for internet safety, I worked for the Bank of England as a non-exec, stuff like that, that I just cared more about it than I cared about whether my company made more money or not. So I decided I wanted to do something in public service. So I set out, I'm quite analytical by background, I set out trying to work out how could I take what I could bring, my skill set, into the public sector. And if I know anything, I spent my entire working life in very large service businesses, consumer service businesses, whether it's supermarkets or broadband, it's organisations that provide services to, to the whole country. And I know how you lead organisations with lots of people scattered around the country. So I looked at that, and I, there's a great big book, by the way, of all public sector organisations. And I went through it all, and, and it's really obvious that the NHS is the biggest and the most important consumer service that we have. So NHS was the top of my list. And absolutely everybody I spoke to in the business community told me not to touch it with a barge pole. Absolutely everybody said to me, no, don't go there. The NHS has swallowed up far better business leaders than you. Um, you, you won't be any good. You won't succeed. Please don't do that. And I'm the sort of idiot that once half a dozen people I really respect told me not to, I decided I needed to find out about the NHS, even if it was only to say why I wasn't going to do it. And so I started visiting parts of the NHS. I was lucky to be introduced to a few people, to a chap called Andrew Morris, who used to run Fring Frimley Park Hospital. Um, he, re he broke the two-term presidency rule. He was a very successful chief exec for 27 years. Um, and I went round Andrew's hospital with him and I visited a um, couple of other places in Essex and I met a chap called Jim Mackey, who was the chief exec of NHS Improvement. And the NHS got under my skin. I just concluded that what you do is so much more important than the baked beans and the broadband that I used to flog, um, but also that it was endlessly fascinating, impossibly complicated, full of fantastic people who cared about what they did. And, and I wanted to join you. So that's my story as to how I've ended up here. I still have people from the business community most days say to me, God, are you still alive? You must be mad. And, and most days I read the press cuttings that come in at four o'clock in the morning and there is something both absolutely wonderful and completely ghastly happening in the NHS at the same time because we're 10% of the UK economy. We're about 7% of the UK workforce. Um, if no, we matter more to people than almost anything else. So that's why I'm here. I don't often get the chance to come to places like, like, like you, like Northampton, because you're such a brilliant organisation. I'm not often allowed to visit outstanding trusts. I spend my time preaching to people who are really struggling, who um, actually often aren't really talking to each other, haven't worked out that people is the most important thing um, about their organisation, and you clearly do. So I read my brief this morning, talking, which told me all the work that you've done over the last, what is it, no, four years, your journey to outstanding. Um, and I thought, oh, why am I going here? They, they know that you're going to teach me, I hope, not the other way around. And the reason I felt that is my brief spoke entirely about what you've done on culture and people. And my observation when I, in my two years in the NHS is that that unfortunately is the exception, not the rule. That the vast majority of briefs I get, and this is my own team producing them by the way, tell me about the finances, tell me about the operational targets, tell me about the structural issues and don't tell me about the people. And, and I, my big passion is I think that service organisations begin and end with the people and we're the most important service organisation on the planet. We employ more professional people than any other organisation in the world. So if we're not agonising about how we recruit, develop uh, and retain our people, I don't know what else we should be doing. That, that's not to say that finance and operations aren't important. They, they plainly are. 
But in my experience, if you have the right people in the right places, motivated, inspired, continuing to learn and develop, actually, they sort the operational and the financial issues out for you. And the opposite is not true. And, and as I said, that is completely true of supermarket retailing and call centre operations. And I've been so heartened to learn about healthcare that when you read any health um, think tank's assessment of what makes for the safest healthcare organisations in the world, they all tell you it's about a culture of improvement, about a fair and just culture that really allows people to do their best work. If you read your CQC report, which I had cuttings of in my, my briefing this morning, if you read any of the outstanding reports from outstanding rating trusts in any sector in the NHS, they all have a really consistent approach to driving improvement, and they all have a just and fair learning culture where people feel like it's safe to speak up and to continue learning. Now, that's not to say that they are perfect. Actually, they will also all be quite self-critical and tell you where they're not getting it right. And, and in my experience, the very, very best organisations in the world are also the most self-critical. So my, my real passion in life is not work. Um, I was a very, very bad amateur steeplechase jockey for 20 years. So I've kept the NHS busy in A&E with multiple uh, fractures over the years. And so my hero in, in my sporting life is a chap called A.P. McCoy, Tony McCoy. He was the top steeplechase jockey in the world for the entire duration of his professional career, for about 20 years. And every evening, and I know him quite well, every evening he used to go home, whether he'd won or lost, and he watched the videos of the races he'd ridden in that day to work out how he could have done better. Didn't matter whether he'd won it or lost it, whether it was Cheltenham or a tiny race course somewhere in the middle of nowhere, he tried to learn how he could do it better. And, and in my experience, that's what the very, very best in the world do. So it's hugely heartening to come here to an organisation that's just been rated outstanding, or very recently rated outstanding, that's working out how you can be even more outstanding. And being outstanding for safety looks like the ultimate bar. Um, though I've just added one on to Christian in the car, which is I'd love your help in how we turn your system into an outstanding system. Because you're a beacon of, of light um, in your system and, 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 and the health and social care system here across the county as a whole isn't outstanding. And you can play a really important role in helping your colleagues come too. Um, so look, I, I promised I would open up to questions, but before I do, I'd like to talk about the people work that we've been doing nationally and why I hope we can help you a bit create the weather, if you like, to try and change the climate to make what you're doing the norm across the NHS. So as I've said, I think we need to raise the importance of people, people issues, to be on the par with financial and operations. So we've written and published an interim people plan, and that's pretty much the most important thing that the people plan says. Our organisations need to take people management more seriously. We need to make the NHS the best place to work in, in the country. We're already the largest employer, but actually, if you look at our staff surveys, and I know yours has been improving, but on average, our staff surveys across the country say that we're not a great employer. And we've all got, and my own organisation, NHS Improvement Staff Survey, is pretty awful, if I'm honest. And we've all got to really listen to that and work out what we have to do, and I know you've done a lot of work on that, it's a never-ending journey of genuinely listening to each other about what makes our jobs brilliant, what gives us real joy at work, and how do we have more of it, and what is it that gets in the way? What are the stones in your shoes that just bring you down? All of us can articulate what they are for each of us. If we face into them and just step by step look to improve and remove the stones and have a bit more of what brings us joy, something really magical happens which is actually we deliver better patient care because we're all free to do what we want to do, which is to look after patients. So it, it's not soft and fluffy, this stuff. Actually, it's some of the most difficult things you ever do. So a lot of what people will say when you ask them about what they want is they want to be able to work more flexibly. They want to be able to get on and develop, but they also really want honest, fair and just management. And for all of us, that's really quite hard. I've got two things in my inbox at the moment, which 
exactly the same issue. One is at a chief exec level in a trust, and one is in my own organisation. And at the root of both, are, these are two people issues, where the individual affected just wants to have an honest conversation with their line manager, and their line manager is terrified about having that conversation. And I couldn't believe the pattern that I had literally both of them. And I was reading your brief and thinking I might share that with you because I'm looking at it and rather than wanting to blame either side, actually neither of the organisations, NHS Improvement I Chair or this particular trust, have invested much in supporting line managers in learning to have those difficult conversations or have invested much with any of us who are, who are the recipients of those difficult conversations on how to, how to learn and develop and take the feedback. And I think that that learning how to lead is one of the most important parts of a really successful people organisation. And all of us, in that sense, are leaders. You know, the way that you put your manager at ease to have the difficult conversation is actually leadership itself. And, and that's how we learn, and that's how we develop a better safety culture. If we do the opposite, well, you all know how that ends. We all hide, we're all a bit scared, whoever's in the powerful position in the conversation and nobody gets out what they really wanted. So I don't want to bring the room down because you guys deliver this, um, but I am a really firm believer, buoyed by my sort of um, icon, Tony McCoy, that this is stuff that you have to keep working at, that it doesn't matter how senior you are, how experienced you are at leading and managing people or being part of a team, this is a muscle that you have to keep practising. And it's really difficult, but you have to keep getting the feedback. So I have made the senior independent director of NHS Improvement do some 360 feedback on me. And I've got my meeting with him tomorrow. And if I'm entirely honest, I'm a bit nervous about it. <laughs> because guess what? I'm human. Um, and I've made the board do a proper self-assessment of how we've done in our first year together. And they've not been used to that because the danger is the more you climb the hierarchy, the less people are really honest with you. But actually, we all benefit from it. So I know that I'll have a brilliant conversation tomorrow with, with Pat Carter, even though I'm a bit scared of it. Um, and he will give me some stuff that will make the organisation better and make me better. And I also have real faith that he will do it in a way that makes me feel good, not bad. Um, otherwise, I wouldn't have asked him to do it, actually. Uh, so I've waffled a bit, but I've tried to give you a flavour Nationally, there is some real stuff we can do to shift this. So we're going to change the way the well-led framework works so that when you're inspected, and you guys will fly in this environment, I can see, when you're inspected in the future, and it'll probably take us a year to change it, inspectors will look at how your culture is embedded, how you lead, what you do to coach and develop people, what the people metrics in the organisation really say, as well as how well governed you are. It's not an either or, it's both. So we can make some climate changes in the centre and we can try and role model those climate changes in the centre. But in the end, you guys are the ones who make the real difference. All I can really do is change the climate and hope that you will then grab it and run with it and that more organisations will do what you're already doing. Hello. Um, I don't know how many years ago, but I went into Talk Talk a long time ago uh, when I worked for a different... I'm sorry. No, I went, <laughs> it's, a good, it's a good thing. <laughs> I, went, I went in to look at how Talk Talk were running, and at the time, okay. I walked in there and felt like I was in a youth club. <laughs> Pool table, everyone had their own desk, very open plan, lovely coffee facilitators, people were playing pool. I guess, what would your one tip be for, I guess, improving our working environment to support our staff? Because I'm not sure That's we've quite question. got that right. Yeah, I really don't think the NHS has got this right at all. Um, less my talk talk analogy, my supermarket life. I could take you to any large supermarket in the country in the middle of the night and the most important person in the shop is the chef. At two o'clock in the morning, the chef is cooking lunch for the night shift because you can't do physical work all night unless you've eaten. And last time I checked, you can't do the really much more important stuff that you all do overnight without eating and taking a break. And yet we don't have those sorts of facilities. So I think we've been very penny wise and pound foolish on, on staff facilities, particularly safe spaces for people to be able to decompress after, after a, a difficult experience or a different, difficult moment. Uh, and the danger is, for my job, is I think I can't tell you what the answer is from the centre. 
I think you know, it would be very tempting to decree from Whitehall that all acute hospitals should have restaurants in, in the middle of the night or that every organisation should provide safe spaces for every... And, and, but in doing the very decreeing from the centre, we sort of miss the... You know, we tick the box but miss the point. So I think you've got to work it out in your own organisations and listen to yourselves on what actually is the pecking order, what's the priority of where to invest to give you the right facilities to, to feel whole in your job. So it's a little of a politician's answer, I'm afraid, but because I want to be able to solve it for you, but I d actually don't think I should. Uh, good morning. My name is Alan Clark. I'm a governor with the Trust. Uh, I'd like to ask you how you perceive the place of innovation in improving the NHS uh, and its place in the grassroots of the organisation. Great question. Um, this is one of the great conundrums of the NHS, that we have so many incredibly smart, incredibly dedicated people who want to innovate across the NHS and actually we are not short of individual innovations. Everywhere I go in every organisation, even some of our most challenged, you will find a team that's doing something brilliant and new and exciting and they will all tell me the same thing which is getting take up and spread of their innovation is almost impossible. Doesn't matter whether you're talking to a single clinician with a brilliant new idea in their specialty or Google Health, they've told me exactly the same thing. Uh, so uh, the um, Carrie McEwen, who's the current president of the Royal, um, the Academy of Royal Colleges, so her job is sort of sheepdogging all of the Royal College presidents. She said at a thing I was at a couple of weeks ago that she thinks the new innovation we need to focus on is learning how to share that the thing that the NHS is really, really bad at is how we spread the innovation, that we've got lots, but we can't work out how to spread it. And um, my, I'm in a sort of job share with David Pryor, Lord Pryor, who chairs NHS England. And I lead on the people side and David leads more on the innovation side. And, and he's really making it part of his sort of life's work to work at how do we change the incentives at the centre and the ways of working out in local systems to enable more of this sharing and scaling of innovation. Because you're spot on, it's hugely important. And, and a really good organisation is, is helping people thrive by giving them the chance to try new stuff and learn from it. It's, I think it, it's something that I found so exciting about coming into healthcare actually, that there is so much potential innovation, but that's the good days. The bad days, you go, why? Why can't we work out how to share it? Why can't we? And I think actually all roads probably lead back to where I started, which is culture. That there's a, a joke that people have been, um, <laughs> I was told, so they said to me, Daddy, your supermarket world, in, if someone in the world running a supermarket invents a new way of stacking supermarket trolleys in their car park that's more efficient and safer, within a year, every supermarket operator in the, in the world will have copied it because retailers spend their life just copying each other's ideas because everything you do is out there. So the problem with healthcare is if that was healthcare, within a year, everyone would be able to tell you why your new method of stacking trolleys was dangerous. <laughs> and, and so it does come back to having a really, I think, a really embedded approach to, to improvement that enables people to test and learn in a scientifically robust way because what you do is much more important than stacking supermarket trolleys. And so, you know, healthcare professionals are right to be more nervous about innovation and a sort of tech you know, break and learn approach doesn't sound good to me as a patient. Um, but, but we've got to have, so we've got to have that methodology, but if we don't have a culture of openness, of learning, of learning from failure, then actually the methodology doesn't work. So I suspect that David's and my two sort of themes meet in the middle in, in culture. It's a bit of a waffly answer, but does that help? Thank you, yeah. You mentioned that the um, NHS is a hugely complicated beast as such. One of the things I'd be interested in is how you feel that compares to the business culture that you worked in and how um, we as people working in it can manage our resilience and how that might be different again to business culture. Oh gosh, we were just talking about this earlier actually, that um, I've come from a sector, telecoms, that is a network. 
So everybody's telecoms network is connected to everybody else's. Everybody's internet platform is connected to everybody else's. So when you run a telecoms business, you are completely accustomed to collaborating with your competitors. So every telco in the country is both a competitor, a supplier, and a customer of each other. So even though the business I ran, I spent, you know, you can Google me, I spent lots of time publicly bashing Gavin Patterson, the ex-chief exec of BT, in a regulatory win-lose fight with BT because they needed to give my business access to their copper wires. At the same time, Gavin and I launched a couple of charities together and we had a very successful TV joint venture. Um, so it was completely normal for us to both compete and collaborate. And when I left, Gavin came to my leaving do, and when he left, I went to his, which surprised a lot of people if you just saw the public Punch and Judy show. So I think in most business sectors, it is increasingly the norm to recognise that you both compete and collaborate in a complex system, that you have stuff where your interests are genuinely aligned and interests where it's, you can just be open and honest and say, we don't agree on this, but that's fine. I, I have found healthcare in general and the NHS in particular less mature on that axis if I'm entirely honest. I think that we've spent the last 20 years, it doesn't matter where you sit on the political spectrum, whether you're Labour or Conservative or anything in between or on either ends, we've, the only real model of change we've em employed in the system as a whole has been a belief that competition will make things better. And no, competition has got some benefits, don't get me wrong, I you know, did run a company for a long time, but on its own, it doesn't work in a complex system. And so I think one of the big shifts we have to make is recognising the power of collaboration. And that in a very complex interconnected system, we all need to learn how to lead in a more distributed way. And that requires a sort of leap of faith because it's much easier to just tell people what to do than it is to sort of hope that if you create the right conditions, they'll work out what to do themselves. It feels a much more risky thing to do if you're not sure. But actually, it turns out the opposite is true. That particularly in something, a sector like healthcare, where um, people are so smart, so highly trained, but also so specialised, we need to have the decisions taken as close to that specialism as possible and as close to the patient as possible, not sitting in Whitehall or in a trust office. And that requires a very different form of leadership. And I got to practice that a bit in my telecoms life because I'm not a telecoms engineer. So I was never going to know what the right answer was in the network business I ran. And I had to learn how to trust people and to create a just and fair culture where I still held people to account even though I couldn't possibly be experts in their subject and I think that's the, the, the journey that we need to go on in healthcare and and other you'll probably hate me for saying this other sectors have worked this out earlier than we have and it's not a private sector business sector thing actually the armed forces have worked this out a bit ahead of us there's a really interesting book written by a, um, a chap called General Stan McChrystal called Team of Teams and he commanded the, US, well, the, the Allied forces in the first Iraq war. And he talks about how they, they were trying to beat an insurgent guerrilla army that didn't behave like theirs and didn't even appear to have any leadership. Um, and that actually just trying to command and control your way through failed totally. And they had to learn how to empower their frontline teams and trust them to make the right decisions in real time. Um, not dissimilar to the journey that we're trying to go on in healthcare. So that's, uh, and, and you know, the, there are examples, and I think you are one of them, of NHS organisations who really are learning how to do this. So we can also learn from ourselves as well as needing, sometimes it's easier to learn from something that's completely alien. It somehow less, touches the ego a bit less, but actually there are great examples across the NHS too. How do you think that people will know that a culture within an organisation is embedded? Ooh, what a good question. Depends which people. I, I think you know when you're working in a team of people who trust each other and um, have a embedded way of working. I think that actually you feel it rather than know it. Um, and that for me is something that's felt very familiar coming from the different organisations I've worked in. 
I, I suspect many of you could walk around a supermarket and tell me quite intuitively whether it was a happy and well-run organisation or not, in the same way that I can walk around uh, a, a treatment centre or a hospital and just instinctively see whether people look like they're interacting in a way that means they're having fun and getting on. So you can actually spot it intuitively. But you asked a more difficult question, which is how do you know whether it's really, truly embedded? Um, and, and I think that you know that it's really embedded when it isn't dependent on a couple of individuals, when it withstands significant leadership changes, and yet the organism itself has got such deeply embedded ways of working that it's not just dependent on individual force of personality, it's beyond that. I think you know that it's really embedded when it is just how the organisation runs, that it's the core of its ordinary processes. So I, get, I look for, on improvement methodology, for example, when people talk to me just about the training courses they've been got, gone on, I think, well, you're on the journey, but you're not there. When people talk about this, this is, these are the decisions we, we take as an organisation and how we take them, I think, oh, it's a bit more embedded. So I also look, I think, is, you know, where's the sort of the structure, the systems, both, both tech systems and human systems that are embedding a way of working that goes beyond a few individuals. How will res impact on safety in an organisation? Brilliant question. Um, thank you for taking the extra one. Um, uh, our black and minority ethnic colleagues tell us very consistently across the country that they do not feel as included as their white colleagues. Um, and it ought to be enough, and I think one of the panellists said this at Confed, it ought to be enough that the moral case for changing that was would be enough but actually if that would be the if that was the case you know 100 plus years of british history well probably a thousand years of of western history wouldn't have happened this is much harder than just winning the moral argument we've got to really properly shift people's attitudes both conscious and unconscious and behaviors in a in a very fundamental way and i think we have to make actually the economic and patient case as well um, and, and uh, your question sort of implies it. If everyone in the organisation feels they have an equal opportunity, an equal right to speak up, an equal opportunity to innovate and learn, then you're highly likely to have the most um, effective organisation that delivers the best outcomes for patients. It's a direct link and we can see it. You know, Michael West's work shows it, um, the res work shows it, there is a direct link between inclusion of the whole team and outcomes for patients. So the question is, what do we do about it? And, and I think that, um, and by the way, there are lots of other people in our healthcare community who don't feel included as well as our black and minority ethnic colleagues, but our, our black and minority ethnic colleagues wear it probably most painfully. And, and, and I think it's one of the ways that we can most meaningfully shift the dial for everyone else if we can shift the dial for our BME colleagues. And that requires people like me who, until I came to the health service, I was used to feeling like I was the outsider. I was the girl in a very male world until actually it was one of the ladies on the panel looked at me and said, but Daddy, you've had this extraordinary privileged life. White women don't understand. And she's right, actually. And I'm on a journey learning what it feels like to not feel completely included in the room. And so I'm a, a non-exec at the Bank of England and the Bank of England is trying to, is on this journey too. The bank is far too white and middle class and desperately needs to hear different voices. And they're, they're, they're not unlike us in the health service. They're very smart, they're very intellectual. They're all broadly all economists and left brain. They like their data. They did a, a survey um, or, or asking people in the bank to describe what it was like working there, what the behaviours of people around them were for them as an individual. And they were horrified to discover that there was a statistically significant difference between their um, BME colleagues and their white colleagues. That actually wasn't between men and women. But on things that, and it's really hit home for me, so whether or not you feel people speak over you in a meeting, there was a statistically significant difference between the Bain colleagues and the white colleagues as to whether or not people spoke over them. Uh, Mike, there's a brilliant professor, he's speaking at Confed this week, David Williams, 
um, who's done some amazing work looking at, he's done it, they did an experiment in Los Angeles where they had two white young men in suits with briefcases and two black young men, same suits, same briefcases, walking across a pedestrian crossing. And they timed how quickly the car stopped. And there was a statistically significant difference between the speed at which the car stopped for the two white men than the two black men. Yes, yeah, so I was going, wow. It's like, and you know, that wouldn't have been conscious bias for any of the drivers. It's so deeply embedded in our Western society, is this. So I think part of the way we change this is we have to tell these stories, and you know, white, relatively privileged folk like me have to start to hear it. Um, but I don't think we can, can expect this to be easy to fix. This is really tough stuff. And I think it's going to require all of us to work really hard at seeing the world through each other's eyes and working out how can we nudge each other just to behave slightly differently. Because if you spend your whole life just with those slight micro impediments in everything you do, you're highly likely to want to push hard and fight or to run away. And we shouldn't be surprised if we see that. We should you know, recognise that that's probably the sensible response in the conditions we've created. And we need to listen and learn. So again, I'm sorry, I can talk about it lots because I feel like this is something, this is actually beyond the NHS. I think that this is something that our country has got to wake up and learn from. And because I think you know, in many ways, Britain has the potential to be the most wonderful multicultural society. But there's so many points of evidence, whether you look at what's been, you know, the four murders in London this weekend, you know, that the society feels very fractured. And I think there's something that the NHS can do for, for the communities that we operate in. Because if we can role model a more inclusive working environment, we're such a big employer and we touch so many people. Just think about the impact we can have on society by doing that well. That's the reason for being cheerful, number one. What did I say? Energy. Thank you very much. <laughs>